Good evening, guys. Yeah, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Am I on? Awesome. Praise God. Glad to be here. I understand that you are going through James, right? I've been given assignment in chapter 4, 1 to 4, verses 1 to 4. If you have your Bibles, and you should have your Bibles, open it. And James chapter 4, very familiar passage to many of you. In our uh, group, when I was a pastor over the uh, a youth group, in our church, we made people memorize the book. Memorize the book. It was a good impact on people. It's great. So if you're there, if you're there, and you remember uh, that James is probably one of the first books that written to Christians, right? And uh, it's very uh, applicable for us today. Let's read it together, and then I'll introduce my sermon and just dive in. And I make you uh, uh, point your attention to chapter 3, verses 17 to 18, because there were no chapter when James wrote it. He didn't wrote with the chapter. So the breaking point is not really good. And so we read from 17, it says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of pleasures that wage war in your members, your lust, and do not have? So you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses. Do you not know that the friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The title of the sermon is Finding Your Peace in Christ. Finding Your Peace in Christ. And the main point that I draw from this passage is basically this. Find your peace in Christ... Because nothing else will do. Find your peace in Christ because nothing else will cut it. There's a story about the father who heard a commotion in his backyard and he saw his children playing with neighbor children. And they were arguing and screaming at one another. And then he came out and said, Look, I need to address this behavior. What are you doing? You can't just behave like that and treat one another with disrespect. And they said, Daddy, Daddy, we're just playing church. We're just playing church. When James is writing these verses, he's not writing to a liberal somewhere over there in San Francisco. He is writing to the church. He's writing to the church. Church that's full of believers, and perhaps unbelievers, but he's writing to the church, and he makes a clear point that they don't have peace. It's interesting that he starts his section here with war. I don't know if you read the great novel of Tolstoy, War and Peace. It started with war and ended with peace. James actually started with peace, and he goes into war section. And the context is very important to look at the context to see that James is saying that the wisdom that comes from above is peaceable. It makes peace. And the fruit of righteousness, the fruit, the seed of righteousness actually grows and produces good stuff only in peace. How is it? that we find ourselves in the churches 
full of strife, war, anger, animosity. How is it? I want to give you three points. We need to analyze the passage together with James and see at the symptoms. What are the symptoms that we don't have peace? You might think that you have a good church, you have a good group, but if there is no peace, there is no righteousness. If there is no peace, the symptoms are there. Then we're going to look at the source of the problem. Now look at the solution for it. Finding your peace in Christ because nothing else would do. Look at the symptoms with me. Now, the symptoms that he brings here, three of them, that we have a problem, right? When we have a problem, we need to analyze what's, what's up with that. When you have fever, you know something is wrong with your body. When you have war in the family, you know that there's something is off. It's nothing normal. And in the context, he's talking, as I said, to the believers, to the believers who had no peace. In fact, this is shocking what he's saying. He said, you, the source of quarrel and conflicts among you. So he mentioned three things, quarrels, conflicts, and wars. Quarrel, conflicts, and wars. It's interesting that we think this idea that the church is the place of fluffy, good people who come together, and if we don't find the peace in the church, what we do? We need to find a good church, a biblical church, a church like a first church in the Bible, and then everything's going to be good. But guess what? James is writing to the first church. This was the first church. These people were in uh, throughout all the region. And I just want to tell you and just get this dissolution uh, with, with the early church that was so good and so nice. It was full of sinful people who were striving and, and at war with one another, and he corrected them. Remember disciples of Jesus? Like your heroes, like Peter, for instance. When they were walking with Jesus and they were fighting among each other, who's going to be the greatest? Great bunch. Remember Roman, Book of Romans? Paul is right into Romans. And if you study Book of Romans, you see the reason why Paul is writing to, to Romans, because they had a problem. In fact, every book in the Bible written, especially in New Testament, because there was a problem. And in Romans, there were problems between Jews and, and Gentiles. And if you want to more, know more why, come to me after sermon, I'll explain. But in chapter 16, verse 17, he said, Now I urge you, brethren, keep an eye on those who cause dissensions. There are problems. How about Corinth? Corinthians church were not that peaceful. They were not so spiritual. In chapter 1, verse 11, he said, For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. <laughs> How about Galatians? Oh, there was a worse bunch because in 5.15 it says, But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Hmm. I thought you were writing to the believers who are nice and fluffy and good. How about Philippians? He put two women on the spot, like before the whole Christendom for all the generations. He named them by name, 4-2. He says, I urge you, Udia, and I urge you, Syntyche, to live in harmony in the Lord. Ouch. Ouch. Church is full of strife and problems. And if we just ignore them, we might live for a little while with some kind of peace, but we need to recognize that there are symptoms in our midst that there is no peace. And James addresses them, and he said, you have quarrels, literally meaning general word for war. Like you have this war animosity. Sometimes you feel it, right? You feel it in your houses between mom and dad. You feel that there's some tension. The war is going on. That the argument started yesterday, and it continues tomorrow in the morning. There's some animosity. Sometimes you come, two groups in the church. They come together, and they sit. One group was over there, and one is over there. And they can't look each other in the eyes because they have a war. There's a, another word, conflict, meaning little fights, fist, combat, like MMA, for instance. But the idea is not that we're fighting one another and, and punching in the face, but we're putting one another down with our words and ripping off reputation of one another. This is a serious clash of conflicts. 
when people are violently attacking other people's names. Now, I've been in a church for a long time, and I've been through some members' meetings where there was supposed to be signed R18 or 16. So you can't, you can't, if you're less than 16, you can't enter because there's just like bombs flying back and forth. And the third word that he's saying, that pleasure <clears throat> at wage war in your members, right? It means that you have a military service, a strategy, a structure to destroy an enemy. There is a strategy to win. Every time when we enter into the battle, argument, there's a reason why we do that, but there's a goal, goal to put person down, to win, right? Why would people attack? Why would nation attack another nation? Just to make a point? No, to win. And so we, we need to look and analyze our lives together, like personal lives, and see and look at your own heart and at your own relationship and see, are there symptoms over there? Like, is, is peace around, surrounding you? Like, you enter into the room and the peace come in. Like, you, you, you just show this peace. The peace, peace is flowing from you. Or you bring strife and anger and frustration. Analyze how you deal with parents. How is your relationship with parents in your house? Is it peace or there's quarrels, there's war, there's hostility, there is desire to rip them apart? I do not know. But there are symptoms. There are symptoms there. And James is, is leading us and saying, well, don't spend time and energy and wars and spend an energy on cleaning to one another and, and choking one another, but cling to the person of peace who would give you this peace. The reason why we do that, because we want to get on the top. We want to get satisfied. We want to have peace by our own means, by winning and destroying a person. But that's not how we get peace. Peace comes only through trust in Jesus. That is it. Trust in Jesus is the only way to satisfaction. Only way. And the problem is so apparent, right? It's so apparent that there are symptoms. They have roots and they have the outcome. They're not just like, oh, we have the symptoms. They're, they're outcomes of the symptoms. Look with me. It says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasure that wage war? The pleasure makes you wage war. There's a war in your member, members. Your lust commits murder. Your envy commits fight and quarrel. Your prayers are empty. And you asking to get all things for yourself and your pleasures. And James is leading us from the evidences and symptoms to a person who is at fault. What is the source of all these problems? You say, okay, I recognize we have a group of people, a church, we have family with the problems, you know, undeniable. And you, you don't have to hide. You don't have to be a Sherlock Holmes to see those things, right? It's like a person sitting, uh, a child sits in the, uh, with a cookie jar and well, all over, you know, crumbs all over his face. And, and then he denies, like, it wasn't me. I do not know. So he, you, you're busted. You're there. Like, it's you. And so when we go to the source of the quarrels, source of fights and source of problems, he identifies who is that person. Who is that person? I don't know if you read the book, The Enemies Within, by Chris Langard. It's a good book. It's talking about, it basically takes John Owen, like very, very famous uh, uh, work, on sin within, and he just popularized so we could understand. But he said this, nails it. He said, we have met the enemy, and he is us. <laughs> oh. Look with me. He said, you know, why, where's the source of all these things, verse 1? Where's the source of all these things? And he said, your pleasures. But watch with me. Your pleasures, it is your members, your lust. You commit murder. 
You are envious. You fight. You do not have. You ask for the wrong motives. And you spending on your pleasures. And it, it is you who are adulteresses. Well, we can't escape. It's like there's so many yous there. It's like, how, where do I go? And he said, you have to be like a doctor. He said, we need to analyze where they're coming from. They're coming from you, from inside of you, from your own heart. From your own heart. And we're going to look at this with the, uh, with, the, with the eyes full of faith. It, it hurts. And we have to analyze. And you have to be honest that in any fight that you have in the church, you have to look first whether you are at fault. First. What, what is this producing this fight, this pleasure, this, this enjoyment, this desire? Now, God is not against the pleasure. He's not against the desires. He's not against passion. He's against seeking this passion outside of Christ. That's what he's against. In Luke chapter 18, the, the, the parable of the sower, he says that the seed which fell among the thorns, these are ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of lives and bring no fruit to maturity. A.W. Pink said, that worldly lusts are those affections and appetites which dominate and regulate the men of the world. It is the heart craving worldly objects, pleasure, honors, riches apart from Christ. Lust, lusting after things. It's not only sexual desire. You know, I don't have to go and explain what lust is because everyone who's sitting here knows exactly what that is, boys, boys and girls. You know and you deal with that for sure. But it's way beyond sexual desire. He's talking to the church that people want something, want to use other people to get as means for them. And the problem with lust is that you're never satisfied. you just never satisfied. And you know that for sure. The lusts have another name in the Bible, never enough. And the lust has two daughters, Named more, more. Always want more. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. We want with our eyes, and we're going to get it. But it doesn't matter how much we get it. Whatever it is, you never get enough. But if you get Christ, he's always enough. He's always satisfying. Lust never says, okay, I could stop now. This is enough. For some people, lust is food. For some people, lust is women. For some people, lust is money or position, whatever it is. It could be ministry that you're lusting after. But it would never be enough because these people and this stuff never could satisfy your soul because you were born for the greater things. That's why Peter said, abstain from fle fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. It's inside of you, destroying you. It's interesting that Owen said about the unbelievers that they could, you know, the reason why an unregenerated man is not under the perpetual pursuit is of some lust is because he's distracted by so many of them. He just, okay, I got this one. I got distracted with this one. Now I need to get, the, and he's always in pursuit of things in the world, never get satisfied. And, and, and unfortunately, we're the same in many ways. Same in any ways, many ways. You know, James 1.14 earlier said, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. He's talking about believers. He's talking about us. We are enticed. We just can't say, well, that's for unbelievers. We're satisfied with Jesus. Are you? Are you? Then he goes to the passion. He said, this is the, the pleasure that wage war, and then, then you're lost, and you're and you zealous, or you, you envy. You're so passionate about things. But I tell you who does this inside of us. It's the old man. That's what he's addressing here. He's addressing that don't walk according to the worldly standard, and don't walk according to the traitor that lives within 
Because the old man, unregenerated man, you cannot change him. Don't walk according to him. Deny his cravings and trust Jesus. Put your faith in Christ, not to pay, put, put faith in that man that inside of you. Because he, is, he doesn't have future. Go to your room, lock yourself up, pray, walk by the Spirit. But I'm afraid, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, friends, I'm afraid that many of you have no idea what I'm talking right now. Walk by the Spirit. What is it? What is it? How do I walk by the Spirit? I know how to walk by flesh, but how to walk by the Spirit, do you know it? Have you asked yourself this question? How to not to repeat or how to win the battle? How to walk by the Spirit? If you do not know it, go and ask the Spirit. Go and pray and ask Him this question. If you don't know how to pray, go ask your leader. Go ask your pastor. If your pastor doesn't know it, go find someone who does. And don't waste your life walking by the flesh thinking that you're walking by the Spirit. Get to know the Spirit. What is this? How? Otherwise, you're going to spend time in quarreling, finding satisfaction, never be filled. The outcome is deadly. We see that the pleasure wage wars, the lust kills, and envy fights and quarrels. So obvious. So obvious. Again, John Owen said, when someone sets his affections upon the cross... And the love of Christ, he crucifies the world as dead, an undesirable thing. The baits of sin lose their attraction and disappear. Fill your affections with the cross of Christ, and you will find no room for sin. The problem is that the traitor who does all things, who lusts and envies and quarrels and fights and seeks pleasure, lives inside, and it is you. You can't just say, well, that's my old man. It is you. You have to take responsibility and say, I do that. Please, forgive me, Christ. And it's interesting that James, if you flip with me back in chapter 1, in verse 20, he identifies that we have a lot of stuff inside of us, a bad stuff. You know, we're not good people. The inner man that is inside of you, if you're born again, is growing, is alive, and indestructible. But he's small and he's growing. And this old man is ugly. He's also like a goblin inside of you. And James in 120, he said, verse 21, he said, therefore putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. All that remains of wickedness. In the original language, it says, in all the abundance of wickedness. This remaining, it's not just like a crumbs left over. It's abundance of wickedness inside of you. And you have to deal with that. Understand and don't deceive yourself that you're pretty much a good person. You need Christ at every moment of your step of, step of your life. It's not only that you need Christ for your salvation. You need Christ for your sanctification. You need Christ to win the battle. You need to trust Him and find satisfaction in Him, in him alone. Paul struggled with that in Romans chapter 7, verse 21. I find then the principle that evil present in me. I want to do good, but I, I don't do it. You see, every believer has two natures. Old, sinful, and good, new, born again that comes from the Spirit. And they're not interchangeable. One is growing, another is dying. The old man is decaying, and he's going to throw everything at you because that's all he has. This, this life and this fear, that's all he has. He's not going to survive after the resurrection. And the new man is indestructible and growing, it says, Paul says, it's renewed day by day, day by day, day by day, by trusting in Christ, trusting in Christ. But this enemy lives in it, within and you have to take responsibility and say, well, yeah, it talks about us. We just don't say, hey, devil made me do it. It's his problem. That group is so bad, they make quarrels. No, it is you in your heart and your sin that causes 
us to fight with one another and tear each other down. Find your peace in Christ. Nothing else will cut it. What is the solution? What is the solution? So, in verse 3 and 4, he said, well, the solution is to go to Christ in your motives and go to Christ for friendship. Turn from self to Christ. We really can't reach complete peace and complete satisfaction by our own means. You know who did accomplish all and is right in God's eyes is Jesus alone. He is the one who accomplished and he was satisfying God. How in the world we are trying to satisfy God apart from Christ? It's impossible. Only in Christ, only through the work of Christ, God is satisfied in Christ, and therefore, he could say about you, good and faithful servant, because you are in Christ. Only through the work of Christ, you have peace. Because there was war between sin and righteousness, between devil and God, between death and life, and God won through Christ. And so, therefore, there is no war anymore. And so, in your motivation, you go to Christ and Say, I deny myself. I deny old men. I will cling to you as my only peace. That's why he said, look, the way how you pray, it's, it's actually very sinful in verse 3. You ask and you do not receive. First of all, you don't even pray. Well, some of you don't even pray. Like, you don't pray. You know why? Because you go get her. You, just, you don't need to pray. Like, why would I spend 15 minutes praying when I could go and do it, right? I just go and do it. Why well, pray? Well, that means that you don't believe God, that he can or he, you need him. But let's say you do pray, and James is saying here, but the worst thing about this, in the first section when he said you use people to bring your satisfaction and you want to win, and by this winning, arguments or whatever you do, to have peace and be on top. But the worst thing about verse 3 is that you use people for that, but now you want to use God to bring pleasures. You want to manipulate God by the prayer, by your prayer, to make yourself happy. And he said, that is evil. This is really bad. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. You don't ask for God's kingdom to be extended. You ask for your kingdom to be extended. And you put the stamp of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I ask that. Well, that's not going to cut it. It's not going to answer selfish prayer. Because selfish prayer just exposes you even more that you are a selfish person. And you know how many prayers are end up in heavenly garbage basket? There's so many of them. That they come to, the Christ, to Christ and he's representing that and he looks like selfish prayer. It's not, yeah, it's in my name. But it's just like it's for his own good or her own good. Just like I don't even going to present it to the Father. Why would I present it to this Father? It just put it in a garbage can. That's not biblical, right? I don't know. I didn't read it. I just think so. Assume, but. Now, J James is addressing the problem of selfish prayer, and this is serious. It is serious. And just exposing us. And, and the person who is thirsting apart from Christ, he's always going to ask for the wrong thing. Is, if, if you get power, you're going to ask for more power, crave for more power. You get money, you crave for more money. If you get uh, popularity, you're going to crave for more popularity. You enjoy sinful pleasures, you're going to get some more later on. Seek more. It goes on. Because the mind and the body of persons, of all men, it just he can't do any other. But God is for us prepared Christ to enjoy him. And we're learning. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, oh, I, man, I'm satisfied with Christ all the time. I'll be lying right now. Like, I know how to do it. Sometimes I'm very dissatisfied with my life and people and wife and children and church members. And I am the one who is just quarrelsome. But it is because I need to learn how to find pleasure in God. 
Psalm 1611 uh, says, You will make known to me the path of life in your presence is fullness of what? Joy. Joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. I want to convince my own heart that I want pleasures that doesn't end. I want a pleasure that comes from above. I want pleasures that in Christ. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And then he identified, he said, well, besides sinful prayer and selfish prayer, prayer, you become spiritual adultery, you adulteresses. Now, I'm, I'm not sure, like, if I, if I would be a f- reader of James, right? This is like, I'm in this Pontius Galatia, Galatia and, and everything, and I got this letter, and I'm reading this, and Peter writing to me, and, and I hear, like, you adulteresses. This would be like a, somebody takes two by four and just slap me in the back with it. It's like, whoa, what? What? Why did you call me? Like, is that? Is, are you talking to me? And, and James says, well, wake up, man. Wake up. Look, the time, whenever you are associating with this old man, you automatically go to the enemy's territory, and you play on his terms, and you fight against God. Because he said, look, you are adulteresses. You're married to Christ. You married to Christ. You belong to Christ. With all that you have, he paid for you. You're satisfied not with this riches, but what he gives you. Riches that is in Christ and heavenly places. There's so many. You don't need to win this argument because your argument is won before God. I don't need to prove anything. I just need to be humble. But you belong to Christ and you his bride. Think about this. You his bride. And... and he uses this, this very vivid word, like I'm, a, I'm married, we're married for 28 years, but in, in no way in my, in my married history, like, and this is for you, if God allows you to be married, great, but I wouldn't recommend anyone, like a year in marriage, you were saying to your spouse, as well, ah, oops, sorry, yeah, that's exactly how you start conversation, sorry, uh, you say, honey, uh, can I go and spend time with my girlfriend? Uh, just we're not going to do anything, you know, stupid. We're just going to go, you know, to movies or coffee shop. How do you think that conversation would end? Pretty badly. You'd be, you'd be living in, in, in a doghouse for a while, I'm telling you, if, if so. That just to assume that, that is very offensive. Like, you belong to me. Your body belongs to me. I'm not against pleasure. You have pleasure with me, but against pleasure to have with some other woman. That would be adultery. That would be hurtful. And so we've taken very seriously this human relationship with our wives and and our husbands, right? But for some reason, God sent his own son. And he said, that's your groom." Prepare yourself. For some reason, we think it's okay to go to the enemy's territory and commit adultery, spiritual adultery, and just enjoy the world just for a little while and come back because he forgives. And he is forgiven. And praise God for the doctrine of election. Praise God that he elected people before the foundation of the world. Praise God. But nevertheless, do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from world. Jesus Christ is your Savior. He is your bridegroom. You are his covenant people. Why would you go and commit adultery against him? It's amazing. More to it, like automatically, you are enemy's territory and you're fighting for the wrong causes. You, you're actually fighting not for only your pleasure, but you're fighting for the pleasures of Satan because you are an enemy of God. You're enemy of God. That's what he said. Don't you know that? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And nobody did it for you. It's your fault. You did it. We did it. We make ourselves enemies of God. You know, have you ever tried to play a volleyball or soccer game and play for both teams right away? How would that go? Like, can you actually win? <laughs> I tell you, you're going to lose for sure. You'll be hated by both teams. Like, you're just scoring on this and then you're just going, what is this? What, what is this monkey business? What is this nonsense what you're doing? And then we go into the spiritual things and in church, and we, we have freedom just to, to go to one side, to another side, to go against God without even thinking what we're doing. But James said, well, reality check. Whose side are you on? Since you're born of the Spirit, since you've been redeemed by the blood of Christ, therefore you're His. You're His. It's amazing. Now, in the last few moments, as a conclusion, I just want to kind of explain to you a little bit, like, why is this happening? We've seen the symptoms. We've seen the source. And we've seen kind of the solution that it's the wrong motives and you're associating with the wrong crowd. That's, that's what you're going to end up doing. But why are we doing this? Like, as Christians, why are we engage in all these things. And, and you are, maybe some of you, maybe some of you will, and I hope you'll grow through it. But I, I want to explain the background a little bit. Why are we doing what we're doing? You know, nobody makes us to do anything. Like you said whatever you said today, it, because it was your choice. You know, nobody made you. Nobody made you to come here. Nobody made you to choose that uh, career, or to go to college. You say, well, well I was compulsed by my, by my parents. No, you made that choice. Nobody made you to choose Christ. You chose him. And I tell you why you choose, because you really, really wanted it. Whatever you do, you wanted to do it at that time because, and it's rooted in your faith. It's rooted in your faith. Because you believe something. You believe that whatever you're going to do right now, whether it's hitting people in the face or forgiving them, is because this is the best thing for you. Everybody operates on the same level. Nobody wants worse for himself. I don't ever see people come, you know, waking up and say, well, I, I, I wish this would be the worst day of my life. And people on the freeway will cuss me and just show me fingers. And I wish that I would be fired from, you know, I wish my parents would never love me. No, everybody loves themselves. And that is normal. This is just given, of course. That's why I want to go to heaven, because I want a pleasure with God. I want to enjoy Him forever. This is what we are about. But the reason why we chose those things, where to find pleasure, is because your faith. Because your faith. Because what you believe. Let me explain. If you chose to watch, let's say, pornography, let's just have this case, like nobody does this, right? But, but if you chose to watch pornography for an hour, you chose this because you think, man, I'm hurting, I just want this, I, I need this, and this is going to bring me pleasure. You're acting by faith. Nobody made you. It was your desire. It's not your nature. It's not your old man made you. It's you believe that this is the best for you at that moment. If you cheated on your taxes, it's because you believe this is the best for your financial situation. If you cheated on your wife, if, you, if you're angry with someone, you think this is the way how I bring myself satisfaction, and this will bring me peace. You're acting by faith. Everything that we do, we're acting by faith. But we believe in sin. We trust in sin that the sin will bring us satisfaction, that this win will bring us peace. And when we act righteously, when you choose against all the odds, when people put you down, when they have no right, when they trash your name, for instance, and you chose to forgive them, that was also your choice because you believe. Because you believe that this, 
not just the right thing to do. This is the most blessed thing to do because you find your peace in Christ. He gave you everything. Act by faith. Remember, I asked you, what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Walking by the Spirit is aligning your pleasure with Christ and trust in Him. I wanted to do what is good in your eyes. I want to trust you that this will bring me the most pleasure. Maybe not now. Maybe I don't feel it right now. But in eternity for sure. And it's worth it. Put your faith in Christ. Find your peace in Christ through faith. Because nothing else will give you that peace. Nothing else. We live in a world that is just so evil. Yesterday I was just watching the news. And in Buffalo, New York, some teenager came to top friendly supermarket and he just shot 10 people and three wounded. You look at the person, he's at the court, you do not know what's happening to him, why did he do that? He's just like boiling with rage and anger. The problem, we understand that this world is corrupt, but the problem is when it happens to the church. How are you doing, guys? Do you have this aura around of you of peace or struggle? Do you exhibit this, this love and kindness because you believe that this is what happiness is about? If everyone would strive for their own things right here, right now, there would never be peace. Peace comes when we're satisfied in Christ and when he wins for us. And he did. And we find peace in him. That is the reason why we can abstain fights, what we can trust in Christ and just be humble. Because humility is the great source of happiness. And it goes counterintuitive to us, to Christians, like, how can this be? I need to be on the top. I want to do this and that. So the difference is, where do you put in your trust? That's all. You can put in your trust in your own man, old man, in sin, in, in people. And I tell you, they're all going to disappoint you. All. They're not going to give you happiness. They won't. Your wife can't. Your kids can't. I have a grandchild. She does a little bit. But even she can't. Christ and only Christ can. Make sense? Well, if it doesn't make sense, we'll ask Peter. He will explain it better. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to just know you, Jesus. We, we're little. We know very little. But we were born of the Spirit, and we understand we have these cravings. We have this hole in our souls, as Augustine said, that nothing could satisfy by God. It's so big, it's so vast, that nothing that we throw in will actually give us happiness. But God himself comes in through Christ Jesus. And we live today without seeing him by faith, that he's all we need. We sing this, we pray this, we read this, but help us to believe it, for you are our satisfaction, and in you we have peace. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.